Against all odds, the Atari VCS is finally here and is finally shipping to backers. We were able to borrow one from one of our viewers, Gregory, and thank you for loaning this to us to do a review. So we already did a disassembly on this. And the first thing we learned that it's not just basically a Raspberry Pi bolted into a plastic shell that's much larger than the Raspberry Pi. For example, like the PlayStation Classic. And this one is actually a semi-upgradable, really tiny computer in a box that looks like an Atari. So that's what's neat about it. We're gonna look at this from a hardware and a software perspective. We didn't have a whole lot of hope for this thing over the past few years as development has droned on because Atari's hit a lot of roadblocks and it started sending out some really sketchy, strange emails. A couple of highlights include Atari getting sued by former employees for not paying wages, and then emails with subject lines like, quote, iconic Atari properties are headed to the revolutionary blockchain-based gaming metaverse, the sandbox and Atari Casino, coming soon. Really on the nose with that one. Let's get into it. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's new keyboards. EVGA's new Z20 and Z15 RGB optical mechanical gaming keyboards have abundant RGB LEDs and programmable macro keys on the left side of the keyboard. They also have a sensor to detect and turn on the LEDs when you're in front of the keyboard and turn them off when distant, offering a unique feature for keywords. The keyboard claims a 0.5 millisecond response time and 100 million keystroke lifespan. Learn more at the link in the description below. So genuinely, this thing does seem like it might have some potential uses. There are a lot of mini PCs out there. You could go buy an Intel NUC. That's one of the longest standing brand names for mini PCs. There are AMD boxes of various names available now as well with various iterations of Ryzen processors and APUs. So plenty of options for mini PCs. This one, however, tries to offer a unique spin on it by obviously reprising the Atari name, which is probably the most valuable thing in this whole endeavor and uh, attaching emulated versions of the Atari games to the device while still giving you some ability to install Windows on it. As for pricing, so viewers like Gregory, who loaned this to us, would have probably paid in the range of a couple hundred dollars to $400, depending on what tier they backed when initially backing it. So the box itself, it's $400 with the controller, which we have here reviewing that as well. And it's $300 without the controller, just as the box. The Atari VCS has its own proprietary app store, which is separated into two categories. So it gives you some expansibility. Games and apps are available as the categories, and both of them are small enough that they have no search function. But that's not really a surprise, nor much of a problem. The apps section includes the most popular streaming platforms, so YouTube, Twitch, Amazon Prime, HBO Max, Disney+, Hulu, Netflix, VRV, and Plex, as well as Discord and Google Chrome as a browser. Most people who bought or are buying the VCS probably were originally doing so because they were interested in the Atari games, despite the fact that it's somewhat useful maybe as something else. And if that's your interest, then 100 Atari games are included in what Atari calls the VCS Vault, and there's another pack of 50 additional games for $5. There's a full list of games on Atari's website if you'd like to see that. Unfortunately, E.T. is not among those. It is not in the bonus pack, it's not in the base pack, and because E.T. is nowhere to be found, uh, this device must sadly get a zero out of 10. So end of review, thanks for watching, we'll see you all next time. Actually, maybe we could live without ET. Antstream Arcade and Air Console are the only game streaming services with dedicated apps on the store, although Google Stadia also works from within the Chrome browser app. If Google Stadia belongs anywhere, it's probably on the VCS. Editor's note here, the previous sentence was written before Google's foreboding announcement that they're shutting down all internal Stadia game development studios. Editor's editor's note note, that previous sentence was written before the Stadia port of the much-loved 2D sandbox game Terraria was canceled because Google locked the account of the founding developer. Fortunately, the VCS does have other actual value beyond Stadia. The VCS native games offered are from a scattering of indie developers. All of the games have Steam pages as of this writing, including Atari's own Missile Command Recharged. Exclusive games would probably die if they were only on the VCS, so this is a good decision, whether or not it was an intentional one on Atari's part. Digital purchases are the only way to officially acquire games using the Atari OS. The SD card slot that was originally planned for the console was scrapped, and although we tried, there's no way to make 2600 cartridges work. Display options are minimal, with options for arcade bezel art pillar boxing on arcade titles, 
scan lines and the visual presentation of vector lines. We found the scan lines to be a little exaggerated, but that's a matter of personal preference. Settings under the game menu are specific to individual arcade cabinets, but shared between Atari 2600 games. 2600 titles have a choice between classic and menu game selection, which either puts the front of a 2600 with interactable switches at the bottom of the screen, or moves those controls to a normal menu window. This is where we get into some of the history of the device, including some of the programming or computer science side of things, where the developers had really unique constraints to work with when building their games for the Atari, the original Atari 2600s. For example, uh, flickering was a problem. It's a notorious Atari flicker that some of you may be familiar with, where you can either set it to, in the VCS, this one, authentic or filtered. And filtered eliminates the notorious flickering problems that were caused by Atari developers being forced to deal with those constrained resources. It's not like they wanted it there. It was a byproduct of the way the games had to be programmed. So the 2600 has no frame buffer. And it's just because of the nature of cost at the time. The amount of RAM required to hold an entire screen's worth of pixel data was prohibitively expensive. Instead, the 2600 only deals with one row of pixels at a time. Pixel here refers to a block of color in software, not the usual pixels you would read about when talking about a display. Here's how it worked. There are baked in registers for six items, which can be scanned out with each row, referred to as two player sprites, one ball sprite, and two missile sprites. One way to get around this limitation is to share one baked in hardware sprite between multiple objects on alternating frames and hope that the phosphorescent dots on the CRT kept glowing for long enough to minimize the flicker. On a modern monitor, this doesn't work. For example, the 2600 port of Pac-Man uses one player sprite for Pac-Man himself and draws him on every frame, but it shares the second player sprite amongst all four ghosts drawing only one ghost per frame. There are ways to mitigate this effect. Crystal Castles, for example, uses a similar method to draw multiple enemies, but the sprites only flicker when they overlap on the x-axis. Because the Atari only deals with one row of pixels at a time, it only needs to pick and choose which sprite to draw or flicker when they overlap on a horizontal row of pixels. Correcting for this effect in an emulator presumably requires some interaction with the game code, one solution doesn't apply to every game. For example, filtering works very well for the 2600 port of Asteroids, but only works sometimes in Crystal Castles, and makes the already unflickery Canyon Bomber look worse. We suggest using the filtered option in the games where it works correctly for the VCS box. All NTSC Atari 2600s run at 60 Hz, technically less, probably 59.975 Hz, but no one's counting. And that's at all times with all games. Atari 2600 games do not use interlacing, so they truly do display full frames 60 times per second, usually with 262 scan lines. Again, NTSC. The functionality of the 2600 is closely tied to the refresh rate of the screen. The VCS is noticeably laggier and runs at a lower frame rate in the main menu when set to 4K versus 1080p with this new device, so we were concerned about the quality of emulation at the higher resolution. As you can see, running our usual frame rate analysis software on footage of asteroids reported quite a few missing frames. We really doubt this is a performance issue though, at least not one caused by the system resolution. Both resolutions, 1080 and 4K, have periods where the refresh rates line up at 60 Hz, and every frame of the footage is unique as well as periods where frames are duplicated. There's most likely a mismatch somewhere between the refresh rates of the Atari 2600, the emulator, the VCS, and the display. The effect is noticeable when flicker is allowed, if ever, and flickering itself is already more noticeable and unpleasant than misaligned refresh rates. It doesn't seem like raising the system resolution affects what the emulator does at all. It certainly doesn't change what the emulated Atari 2600 does. A 2600 displays an absolute maximum of 160 by 192 software pixels, no matter what, and usually less than that. Resolution should affect post-processing effects like scan lines and glowing vector lines, but in comparison screenshots, we saw no noticeable difference in the appearance of scan lines at 1080 and 4K. Smoothing, or aliasing, would be affected by the system resolution under normal circumstances, but there's no smoothing applied to 2600 games. Rendering a square at 1080p looks the same as rendering a square at 4K.
The only part of the VCS vault that would really benefit from a higher resolution is the 3D arcade cabinet interface, which is clearly rendered at 1080p no matter what, implying that everything else is as well. Release of the VCS has been delayed for multiple publicly stated reasons, one of which was the decision to move from the pre-Ryzen Bristol Ridge A10 APU that was originally spec for the system to a first-gen Zen APU the R1606G. The original decision to avoid Ryzen was made because of thermals and cost, and the low-power R1000 Zen chips hadn't yet been released. One other reason given for the eventual switch to Ryzen was to support 4K 60fps HDR content. That may technically be within the capabilities of the APU used, but it's optimistic for anything beyond streaming videos, and even that proved difficult in our testing. The R1606G is an embedded BGA chip released in 2019, but the generationally equivalent socketed APU would be 2018's Athlon 200GE, which we reviewed. The 1606G is two cores, four threads. It has three Vega CUs, written as Vega 3 in the spec sheet, and just like the 200GE, these specs are the same. The 1606G, though, differs in that it has base and boost clocks of 2.6 GHz and 3.5 GHz for boost, while the 200GE socketed CPU only had a base of 3.2, period. We're mentioning these Athlons for context, not to degrade the VCS. The main purposes of the VCS would be to play Atari games and stream videos, neither of which require powerful CPUs. AMD lists TDP on the 1606G as 12 to 25 watts, a major consideration for a tiny device with limited space for cooling, and spot checking full system power draw showed the VCS pulling 29 to 30 at desktop and 16 watts when emulating asteroids for the 2600. The move to the R1606G was made public in March of 2019, quote, allowing the VCS to benefit from a simpler and more effective power architecture and thermal solution, meaning that the change was accompanied by significant hardware changes elsewhere in the system. That was the reason they moved. The launch target was only shifted to end of 2019 with this announcement, which in hindsight seems incredibly optimistic, even in the pre-pandemic world. We'll discuss this more in detail later, but we were able to install Windows 10 on an internal M.2 SATA drive, and were therefore able to download Cinebench R15 and run it. We chose R15 because we have years of results for it, and because we don't need to be able to run the more difficult ones on this CPU. The R1606G would be comparable to some of the Athlon CPUs we've tested, and as you can see here, the single-threaded result was 131 points, multi-threaded was 379. In terms of score, that puts it closer to the Zen Plus Athlon 3000G score of 125 single-threaded and 373 multi-threaded, as opposed to the 200GE Zen 1 and its result of 126 single and 352 multi. Logging clock speeds during a Cinebench pass revealed why. The 1606G in the Atari runs at 3.5 GHz under full load, all core, like the 3000G, and the 200GE is locked to 3.2 GHz. We didn't conduct this additional test formally, but as a quick aside for thermals, we ran some data during the Cinebench pass. T-Dye rose gradually from about 65 to 70 degrees Celsius. When the two-minute multi-threaded benchmark began, T-Dye jumped instantly to 89 degrees and the system fan started screaming. But that temperature remained stable for the brief duration of the test without dropping any frequency. Onto the controller. The package which was loaned to us included an Atari Wireless Classic joystick, as opposed to the more conventional Xbox-style Atari Modern controller. It can be connected via Bluetooth or USB, and by necessity, it has had enough buttons added to it to map all the expected controller functions, like menu and back. Atari has released blog posts in the past throughout the VCS's development cycle, one of which covers the new joystick's design and skirts around saying the original CX-10 and CX-40 controllers were a pain in the ass. The way they said it was, quote, our engineers were reminded of the stiff, crab claw feeling in their hands that took them back to their childhoods, caused by an intense death grip while punching the corner red fire button. Yes, that, that sounds like something great. Original Atari 2600 controllers used four membrane switches for detecting eight directions of movement, basically a D-pad with a stick glued to it, plus one additional switch for the fire button. That's it. Atari had this to say about its solution for the brand new wireless classic joystick. Quote, ultimately, and after many extra weeks of testing different combinations, the team identified and selected an optimal setup using a hall sensor. 
Hall sensors are well known in the world of high fidelity audio product manufacturers for their extreme sensitivity. Most often used in volume controls and mixer controls, Hall sensors are always in high demand, and this year's pandemic related shortages made them particularly difficult to secure. End quote. It seems likely that the Hall effect sensor is the component that Atari referenced multiple times as the source of delays in joystick production. It previously said that there was a critical and very scarce component missing. We think this was it. The sensor is not used to detect directional movement, though. When we took apart the joystick, we found four membrane switches for that purpose, just like the original controller from 1977, and instead, the Hall Effect sensor is used to detect rotational movement in the stick itself, which can be twisted like a Pong controller in compatible games. Because the controller still uses four carbon contacts without analog pressure sensitivity, movement is limited to exactly eight directions, with X and Y axis movement values of either minus one, zero, or one. That means the classic controller isn't really suited for anything outside of Atari games. For example, a 360 controller's joystick used with X input on PC can generate values between negative 32,768 and 32,767 on the X and Y axes. We had one intermittent issue with the classic controller. The twist control, enabled by the Hall Effect sensor that's used for pawn and breakout, had a dead zone. That dead zone caused the paddle to skip across the screen when the stick was twisted at a certain angle. We never opened the stick itself where the sensor is contained, and it's sensitive anyway, so we're not exactly sure of its internal componentry or why it would do this. The problem seems to have mostly been solved, like most things, by turning it off and on again but it resurfaces occasionally when tested in Atari's free test gamepad application, although it seems to go away again when we turn the camera on. This application also reveals that the ABS underscore rudder value determined by the joystick rotation hovers between two values at all times, which causes the pawn paddle, for example, to judder constantly. At the end of the day, though, if Atari's main goal was to make a controller that's more pleasant to hold and use than the original 2600 joystick, they succeeded. The stick doesn't feel like it has to be bent to the breaking point to make it move, which means it can be held lightly in the left hand and controlled with the right. It's tough to make fine adjustments by twisting the joystick, so this is a downside too, but turning down the sensitivity in games like Pawn is a good idea and will help with that. We covered most of the physical aspects of the console in our earlier teardown, but to reiterate, it's contained in a solid plastic shell with small vents on either side of a larger screened off vent at the rear of the console. The fan is a simple blower solution, much like what's found in a laptop, and likely exactly the same component, and is located in the center of the chassis. Disassembly isn't as easy as it could be, given that the chassis has to be opened in order to install a customer serviceable M.2 drive, but nothing has to be unglued or peeled apart in a way that does permanent damage. The rubber feet on the bottom of the case can pop out partially, which is nice, and four torque screws underneath can be removed. The front and back of the console pop off, and then the shell comes apart in two halves. The front veneer of the case on the special pre-order edition is genuine wood, allegedly, referred to as, quote, engineered wood in the design documents. It's a minor touch, but it's a nice one given that the original wood veneer of Atari 2600s used vinyl stickers, just like station wagons of the time. There are four USB ports in total, which may be just enough. Interacting with web browsers or doing anything in PC mode requires a mouse and keyboard, or the Atari companion app on a mobile device. Potentially, this takes up two USB ports, plus a third if the controller is being charged or used without Bluetooth. Some other apps, like YouTube, aren't mobile versions and require mouse and keyboard to navigate. If the fourth slot is used for connecting a bootable drive, that's every port filled. Other I.O. includes HDMI out, Ethernet in, power in, the VCS uses an external power supply for that. And as mentioned earlier, there's no SD card slot on the final model. The power button is also on the rear of the system, which keeps the front of the system nice and clean and simplifies assembly by mounting the button directly to the PCB, but also makes it difficult to turn on the system without looking at the back of the system. Something we didn't cover in the teardown was SSD installation. This works as it would with a normal PC motherboard, but there's no mounting hardware included with the VCS. Atari's installation guide suggests using a 304 panhead screw uh, M3 by 4 to do this. We were forced to jury rig a standoff with a plastic washer and a screw. We have some M.2 screws from spare motherboards, but most people don't. And there really should just be a standoff and a screw pre-installed for any users 
who don't have drawers full of assorted PC screws. As for compatibility, the VCS is only compatible with M.2 SATA SSDs. NVMe drives will physically fit into the keyed slot, and there are some mentions of NVMe and BIOS that we didn't dig too deeply into. But official policy from Atari is that only M.2 SATA drives will work. We initially tried installing an NVMe drive, but it wasn't detected. On to the software now. Atari OS is a custom branch of Debian, although we can't know exactly how custom. The front end, through which other games and apps are launched, was built in Unity. Resolution can be set to either 1080p or 4K, although the front end runs noticeably at a lower frame rate at the higher resolution and is under 30 FPS. As we mentioned earlier, this doesn't seem to affect emulation within the Atari VCS Vault app, but it makes navigating and typing in the login screen and top-level menus laggy. When using Atari OS, we highly recommend setting the system resolution to 1080p unless it's being used specifically as a 4K video streaming box. Even then, we found that playback of 4K60 videos on YouTube lagged frequently and caused the VCS's fan to ramp. Also, since the app is essentially the desktop version of YouTube and there are no options for UI scaling, the interface was much more difficult to navigate at 4K. 1080p is the natural resolution for the VCS. On startup, the VCS looks for any connected bootable USB drives, and if it finds one, it'll boot to that drive instead of the internal Atari OS install. This is something that the system architect Rob Wyatt, a major figure in OG Xbox and PlayStation 3 hardware development, discussed fairly early in development, which is to say before he quit and sued Atari over unpaid salary, and even further, before Atari subsequently failed to show up to court. Knowledge of these events kind of undermines the open and optimistic tone in the Q&A post written by Wyatt, but much like Jay, we digress. Allowing the VCS to boot other operating systems is a huge value add, although modders would have made it happen whether or not it was allowed. As it is, it's fairly easy to stick an M.2 SSD into the board, boot from a live USB drive, and install an OS to the disk, or just run a Linux distro from a flash drive, for that matter. It's theoretically difficult to interact with or corrupt the built-in 32GB flash module without booting into Atari OS, since the external boot devices preempt booting from internal storage. In practice, the Windows 10 installer was alarmingly prepared to attempt to format the built-in flash module, and the disk management tool inside Windows 10 didn't seem like it would have any problems formatting it either, but we didn't try. We had difficulty installing Windows 10 to an M.2 drive on the Atari itself because Windows couldn't assert control over the boot process, but we were able to transplant an existing installation of Windows into the system from elsewhere. We used Windows 10 for the novelty of being able to run our usual benchmarks within VCS, but there are lightweight Linux distros that would probably be more appropriate for the hardware for daily use. Users should be aware that bootable M.2 drives don't automatically take priority like bootable USB drives do. The intended purpose of adding an internal drive is really just to provide extra storage for Atari OS applications. To boot from an internal drive using a keyboard and hitting the escape key will bring up the BIOS menu, and that contains a boot override option. Accessing any other BIOS options requires a password which is really secret. It's Piano18482, as of this writing. There's also a PC mode app within Atari OS, but functionally all this does is remind you to plug in a boot drive and then reboot the system. It won't change the priority. Because of the built-in support for other operating systems, any criticism of Atari software is tempered by the fact that users can stick a drive in and set it up however they want. It would be very easy to set up the VCS as your own emulation box, without any hard modding or warranty voiding. Coming to the end then, the Atari VCS is functionally a small computer. And there are other boxes that do that. There are cheaper ones in this category as well. But for those who jumped on the bandwagon immediately and ordered either the collector's edition and joystick bundle for $300 or the Onyx edition for $200, the end result isn't such a bad deal. We don't have much confidence in Atari OS getting long-term support. But once you add in Atari OS, a box that can be turned into something else if you wanted it to, and the other early backer rewards, we're prepared to tentatively say that the Atari VCS is actually not a ripoff, at least not for those early backers in those tiers that we mentioned. Now, going forward, it gets a little trickier because as this thing rolls out past just the initial backers, you're looking at higher price points. It's $300 plus, $400 plus, depending on where you buy it and what edition you buy. 300 plus is a hard sell here, but we also suspect that Atari sold more VCS units as a crowdfunding reward 
than they ever will post-launch. So it may not matter by now. This is more of a post-mortem than a review in that case, and the product hasn't even officially been released yet. Determining the target audience for the new Atari VCS is a little bit difficult because the vast majority of units sold through Indiegogo before Atari even knew what it was making. And that's not an insult or throwing shade, that's just objectively what the fact was. Atari was changing its plans constantly for this design and only recently finalized everything. When the announcement first came out in March of 2018, it seems like the target audience was anyone who had nostalgia for Atari games or who had spare shelf space after buying 2016's NES Classic and 2017's SNES Classic. Now that units actually exist in the wild, the target audience is anyone who wants a streaming and emulation box with the novelty shell and who doesn't mind paying a premium for it. There are more cost-effective and convenient and legal ways to play Atari games, like using the Internet Archive's free in-browser emulation or buying one of the many, many Atari flashback systems that have come out since 2004. Allowing users to boot and install their own OS mitigates some of the long-term concerns for the Atari VCS, most of which would be what happens to the Atari OS and the included apps and uh, promises of software after it stops moving units. But because you can technically put an OS on here, uh, well, you've got something you can do with it. So overall, we talked about the hardware previously, but the hardware genuinely did surprise us. We thought it was going to be open it up and it's a Raspberry Pi zzz, bolted into some plastic and that's it. So this was a lot more than that to Atari's credit. And uh, then what's left of it's the software. And we talked about all of that in this review. So if you got it for 200 bucks, it's really not a bad deal. Once you're starting to pay 300 plus, especially with the post backer rewards uh, purchases, it does get harder to to justify, and you're basically in the situation of, well, what do you value the novelty of the shell at? And uh, beyond that, you're just weighing the value of the, the nostalgia, which could be satisfied potentially by playing the games again for free. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help set directly, and we'll see you all next time.